Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those who I haven't, uh, the op haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, I'm Nadine Lati, and I have the pleasure to introduce you uh, the two participants to the fireside session. Uh, Mrs. Marie-Christine Dupuy-Danon and Monsieur Roger Kukerman. Uh, Marie-Christine is an international expert in criminal finance, terrorism finan financing, and money laundering, and of course, the way to a better governance. She began her career as investment banker, advised many governments, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, for the management of their finances, and then she joined the United Nations offices on drug and crime in the field of anti-money laundering. Uh, actually, since 2004, she's the manager and founder of Citricom, a consultancy firm specialized in compliance and ethics for the highest entities, such as governments, international organizations, and leaders. She wrote many books and articles related to terrorism financing and financial crimes. It's a long list, so... Just to mention a couple of them, The Watchmen, Les Guetteurs, highlighting the role of French intelligence, fighting the Islamist terrorism, and criminal finance. Mrs. Dupuy-Danon is also a lecturer on behavioral ethics and leadership in business schools and other academic scenes. She's graduated from the famous HEC Business School in Paris, and holds a master's degree in communication and social science. I enjoyed the opportunity to welcome her husband, uh, he, who is in the audience with us, our French ambassador uh, in Israel, Mr. Danon, Eric Danon. Now, let me introduce you, uh, Mr. Roger Kukerman. I am sure that most of you in the audience already know him personally, and, or at least uh, from his various uh, activities, professional and social activities. Mr. Kukerman comes from the banking industry. He was uh, the CEO of uh, the Edmund Rothschild Group for 36 years. He also served as chairman of the Israel General Bank. No? 36 years? Right. Uh, he also served as chairman of the Israel General Bank and chairman of several mutual funds. His great experience includes directorship of companies and banks, such as Credit Suisse Asset Management and the Association of French Bankers. Mr. Kukerman is also a board member of the well-known Kukerman Investment House and its private equity funds, Catalyst. Today, Roger, you will tell us more about the banking industry, but I would like to mention um, your engagement through some of your social activities that reflect your values and your priority for ethics. You've been nine years president of the CRIF, the roof body of all French Jewish institutions. Your former vice president of the World Jewish Congress, and still president, vice president of the Alliance Universelle, or Alliance Israelite Universelle. Um, you are the author of The Capital in the Japanese Economy and Ni Fier Ni Dominateur. Mr. Kukerman is graduated from a leading business school as well in Paris, the SCP, and holds a doctorate in economics. So, now, the topics of your fireside will be criminal finance and governance. Let the session begin. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you, Nadine. Merci. We, we worked on ethics and finance, so I'm going to challenge you, Roger, on this one. Uh, first, let me express my gratitude to the organizers of the forum for reminding each and every one of the necessity to consider 
the ethical dimension of our actions and behavior, and for doing so in this symbolic city of all places, Jerusalem. Thank you, dear Bruno Cohen, for carving a space in the agenda for this discussion on ethics in finance. I'm very, very much honored to share the floor with you, dear Roger Kukerman, um, and benefit from your unparalleled experience and wisdom. <laughs> Finance, and we'll try to demonstrate that. It's a fantastic field of reflection and action for ethics. For there is a paradox. Although it's one of the most strictly regulated industry, right, it suffers from one of the worst image, ethic-wise. And preparing for this panel, I have asked dozens of uh, clients, as well as colleagues and students, from a wide range of countries, ages, and professions. How do you assess the level of ethic in finance? And in response to that, I got a list of infamous cases that once hit the headline, the Madoff scandal, the subcrime crisis, scams and frauds on the financial markets, the Panama Papers and Pandora Papers and other leaks, bank chasing customers to offer services to assist in capital flight and tax evasion. So no doubt most professionals of the sector have a high level of ethical standards. However, when things go wrong, they go wrong at a big scale. <laughs> In these opening remarks, and in order to pave the way for the debate, let's sort out the ethical breaches and ethical challenges into four categories. Globalization and governance, financial capitalism, culture and practices within the finance industry, and simply flows in the human nature. And I'll start with this one. First, obvious but worth remembering, finance is a tool. And a tool is neither good nor bad. It's the use you make of the tool that matters. But this being said, it is a tool manipulating a very dangerous material, money. Because money has inner features that can easily induce a drift from self-interest, which is human, towards selfishness and greed. Let's recall that there was a time not long ago when greed was considered a positive thing. I quote the world of Michael Douglas in Wall Street One, 1987. <laughs> greed is good. <laughs> and everybody applauded, because it's what human nature is about. You always want more. You don't settle for what you have. But there's a breaking point where legitimate appetite for success turns into madness, and then greed is bad. And Madoff was the personification of this. He did not even invent the scheme that he used. It was created by an Italian guy, Charles Ponzi, in the 1920s. But somehow, Madoff managed to use that trick, which is well known by all the economists <laughs> around the world, and should have been better known by the financial regulators, to steal and lose $65 billion. And let me tell you something quite disturbing. There will be other Madoff. It's the same drive that is involved into corruption. Why looting billions of dollars of assets from a country? What do you want? More. There's a direct relationship with my next topic, which is globalization on governance. The idea is not to blame finance for all the evil side of globalization. 
it would be unfair, and it would be completely caricatural. But let's acknowledge that finance has taken advantage of the situation regardless any ethical boundaries. When the world became a global playground after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union, big companies and wealthy individuals started to shop around for the best tax environment, the best financial services, and the least regulated places. And this resulted in blurring the lines between um, legal behavior and a moral behavior, right? Let's take tax optimization, for instance. It might be legal, but is it moral? And the financial services industry jumped onto that opportunity to offer all the, those who could afford them tailor-made services based on bank secrecy and the use of zero-tax jurisdictions. You want to go for a shell company, incorporate or buy one, try the BVIs, the British Virgin Islands, try Bermudas. If you're interested in an assets protection trust, just go for the uh, British Channel Islands, and so on. So the services existed before, but what happened was that it was developed to an unprecedented scale. And offshore finance has swollen, and it continues to thrive by offering a lesser level of ethical standards. And this is being revealed in all the leaks the Panama Papers, to the Pandora Papers, and all the other offshore leaks. And this is a big issue, because it is a shock to the public opinions when they find out that among the clients of those offshore services, there are heads of states and governments, there are football players, and there are all the people they actually look up to. And it is also a big issue, if not a bigger issue, that those services as are being used by criminal organizations, the mafia, the terrorists, those causing a threat to the rule of law and a threat to democracy. So those loopholes have been addressed by the international community in an effort to try to curb on criminal finance, money laundering, terrorism financing, and corruption, just to name a few of the side effects of globalization. But too little, too slow. And global governance is entering a very difficult phase as we see more and more countries which openly play their own cards without much respect for the common rule. A couple of worlds also on financial capitalism and the excesses of market-driven and capitalistic economy. Finance is now everywhere, <laughs> even in sectors that were traditionally not profitable sectors. Is that a bad thing? Not necessarily if finance goes with decency and ethics, but we did not live in a perfect world. One major ethical challenge lies in the fact that some powerful funds, and especially pension funds serving pensions to retirees, put a tremendous pressure on companies to see high yields without taking into consideration the effects on the social, on the human, and on the environmental effects, and put an exclusive focus on the short term without taking into account the medium and long term effects on companies. This is all about responsibility and accountability. And speaking of accountability, what do you think of the creation of financial instruments to trade responsibility for money? Think of the 
carbon credits or the rights to pollute is paying off to get rid of one's share of responsibility acceptable? Is that okay? Last but not least, some practices at use within the finance industry have been identified of being really at risk of creating ethical blindness. Yet they are hardly questioned at all. Let's take the reward policy. Staggering bonuses that can easily turn into a faulty system and push people too far, especially on the trading floors. And it's probably an easy way out to blame it on the individual, like Nick Leeson, who brought down the eldest British bank, the Bearings, or Jérôme Kerviel with the Société Générale. But we cannot forget that there is a prominent culture which favors reckless behavior, risk-taking. As far as we, you win, this is okay. Just go for it until it's too far. So, and we could go on and on. So at the end of the day, I was thinking, and I'm sharing that with you, Finance, it's like the force in Star Wars. Its creative power is only matched by its destruction potential. So the first question I would like to ask you, Roger, how do you curb the dark side of finance? Is ethic an efficient weapon for that purpose? Well, after having heard uh, Marie-Christine's uh, description of the uh, banking, the financing world, I'm a bit embarrassed to be a banker. No, I have <laughs> been one myself. Uh, this is especially fine. in front of an audience which is composed mainly of doctors of the body, doctors of the spiritual side. And uh, we are talking about money. Money is very low in the hierarchy of, of values and of activities. But it's true that uh, uh, ethics is a, is a major issue in, uh, in the, this business. There are different types of uh, ways to break uh, the ethics. Uh, the, the first one is uh, the tax evasion, which has been shown by the Panama Papers when uh, the 300 uh, journalists uh, distributed in 80 countries practically the names of uh, a number, uh, an unbelievable number of ministers, heads of states, kings, uh, prime ministers, uh, football players, that's okay, I don't mind. Uh, and, and of course, it, it, it shows, it, it, it leaves a shower uh, on, on everybody, of course. Uh, and... Uh, uh, I think, nevertheless, that uh, things have improved because of the Panama Papers and because of the attitude of some Western governments. Uh, for instance, uh, the fact that uh, uh, Switzerland has stopped uh, allowing, and Switzerland is, is a very important financial country, and uh, Switzerland has stopped completely uh, having anonymous accounts uh, uh, the recent agreement between France and Israel also is a sign of the willingness of uh, many countries which were used to practice numbered account. Uh, this is a, also a sign of uh, a change in the problem of tax evasion. Uh, of course, it's, it's, it's a way for mafia and uh, other unpleasant uh, bodies to work, but I, I think that there is more and more at least in the Western world, uh, the willingness to fight uh, against tax evasion. So that is one item. Tax evasion means that uh, people are trying to steal money from the, their government. But there is another problem which is maybe more interesting for me at least uh, because it reminds me when I was six, 26 years old, when I entered the uh, Edmund Rothschild Group, and I was not CEO on the first day by far, uh, 
when I entered the group, I, in the first week, I happened to find uh, a contract uh, which was showing that uh, a listed company, Sucrerie Brésilienne, uh, would be uh, the object of a takeover bid at a price which was 25% above the uh, stock exchange level. Uh, I had no money uh, at that time, and even I didn't really think that uh, it was breaking any rule because uh, I was not conscious, and many people at that time were not conscious that uh, there was a problem with inside information. So I didn't buy anything, but I, I gave the, the tip to one of my friends who just entered the Crédit Lyonnais. <laughs> <laughs> and he bought some shares. And instead of earning 25%, he lost 25% because I, I didn't read properly the contract. And it, had, it was indicated that it was subject to the agreement of the board of directors of both parties, the buyer and the seller. So it was my first experience with inside information. And inside information has taken a, a huge uh, part of the uh, responsibility of the bad uh, image of the, of the, for instance, uh, men like Ivan Broisky, who was a prominent financier in New York, uh, used to buy from Drexel Burnham inside information, which he used to earn the money and he become, became a millionaire until he lost everything uh, because a scandal uh, appeared. The same happened with other people. Uh, Martha Stewart <coughs> also was owning a company. Uh, she had asked for an FDA agreement. She knew the answer would be negative, and when she knew it, she sold her shares, uh, which was typically a fraud, which was unacceptable. So this kind of uh, operation uh, is really uh, even worse, to my opinion, than tax evasion. But it's it's a matter of opinion, and uh, and and you you have a lot of that, and um, uh, also Milken was a man who also fraud, in the, in a huge uh, size, uh, based on on information that uh, their connection were uh, was able to 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 get, in order to 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 make deals which were unfair to the other shareholders because the victim in this case is the other shareholders. And, and then there are, there are a third category, which are the crooks, and Madoff is typically a crook. I, I am amazed that uh, a man like Madoff, who has uh, succeeded in attracting $65 billion, but not everything was lost, uh, much less was lost, unfortunately. But uh, a man like Madoff was able to become chairman of the NASDAQ, which was unbelievable. He was a chairman of a, a body which was controlling the stock market. So it shows that uh, how naive everybody is because he was just proposing to have uh, profit even when the market was, was very bad. And some people reacted uh, and thought that it was impossible, but the majority went and, and uh, accepted to take, to help him uh, developing his... his uh, terrible uh, business of uh, Ponzi, uh, Ponzi uh, practice. So these are the three types of, uh, of activities which uh, uh, are within the, the idea of, uh, of uh, breaking the, the laws and the morale uh, of a financing activity and which uh, gives a bad image of all the banking system, of course. But nevertheless, I would not be so pessimistic uh, because I think that the more and more governments uh, in the Western world are, are fighting uh, against the, these three ways of, uh, of stealing money and, uh, and that uh, uh, it's today only very small countries uh, which are still practicing uh, this uh, type of uh, bad management. I'm sure that there are many questions which could be put by the by the audience, by the doctors of the uh, body and of uh, the spiritual. 
It's another world. Sorry, we we're talking about the third world and the, uh, you know, and the progressive world. And I was saying, you know, for many years there was no regulation, and the Western world profited. Now we want to profit. It's our turn, but now there's regulation, so you're not giving us a chance to profit when we can finally, you know, raise the bar on our end. So I'm curious as to your take on that. You want to start? Well, uh, it's true that the heads of states. Uh, of uh, developing countries uh, were uh, very active in evading funds, uh, investing in Western countries and leaving their population li uh, to, in very poor conditions. Uh, and this is effectively uh, things where the Western world closed its eyes, uh, especially in countries like, like uh, Switzerland, but only, but not only, also France, and the uh, and UK and Germany and, and the US accepted uh, that black money, uh, which was turned into properties, uh, which uh, were practically evading from these poor countries, which uh, the Western world uh, did profit of their, of their sources and, and did not let them uh, enjoy uh, to develop the population. I agree, I will just complement. I, I have heard this argument of the regulation impeding the development of regions of the world um, that want to thrive and are stopped by those regulations. This applies more to the industry or, or environment um, related regulations rather than money because mon as far as money is, is concerned, as uh, Roger Kukerman is, has explained, um, assets looted out of uh, countries um, in, in poor regions of the world. This has been to the detriment of the civil society, of the economic world, and of the population at large, only to the benefit of uh, a couple of leaders. So um, in those countries, um, the uh, financial or anti-corruption type of regulation and legislation are rather less welcome. <laughs> Um, it's true that although a lot of uh, anti-corruption, anti-money laundering regulations were enforced, still the money continued to be accepted in uh, many countries, offshore places, but not exclusively of, of offshore places, because if it's pre-washed somewhere, then it's acceptable. Uh, so the whole cycle of laundering money, whose purpose is to uh, hide the criminal origin of the funds is efficient uh, and, uh, and still uh, enables a lot of uh, misdoings uh, to as, happen. Uh, as you worked on these subjects, do you have proposals to fight against this trend of, of laundering money and, and uh, how, how can it be more efficient than it is today? First, it's, it's important to just to um, channel the idea that it has improved a lot uh, since the beginning of anti-money laundering legislation uh, in the mid-90s. Before the mid-90s, everything could be done anywhere, even bringing suitcases of money on just uh, opening a banking account. So now it's becoming more and more complicated to do so. It means that you have to use um, service providers, accountants, lawyers, and, uh, and to open many companies in many places to make sure that the money is split in different... Uh, and circulation of banknotes is very limited. Depending on the regions, you still have uh, regions of the world where cash money is, uh, is being used. And this is important because uh, a lot of people do not have access to the banking system. Now this is changing with digitalization, as a lot uh, can be done through the smartphone. So you have people that do not have bank accounts, but that are able to use their smartphone 
for digital payment. So the world is not working as one. You have different paces according to the different regions. And the, the issue with the, the money laundering is that the criminal organizations are very rich. So they can afford the best services always. So they can, they can go to uh, the best service and they don't go as a mafia guy. You don't know. They go as someone who looks perfectly normal and professional and who's probably graduated from a Ivy League university. With a nice tie. With a nice tie, always a nice tie. It makes all the chic. Uh, <laughs> so it's not right or white or black. This is, you have 50 shades of gray and, uh, and you have people navigating that industry uh, with the best piece of advice so that they can elaborate money laundering scheme. And the richer the criminal organization, the more sophisticated the laundering uh, scheme will be. I would like to add a, a chapter on the oligarchs. Because uh, uh, it so happens that uh, Mr. Putin, who is uh, so aggressive uh, in Ukraine, uh, is also aggressive in the financial world, mm. uh, which is under his uh, responsibility. And uh, the development of uh, oligarchs uh, in Russia, which uh, is uh, spreading all over the world because the oligarchs have invested all over the world, uh, is, is uh, uh, a terrible example uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, wealth created all of a sudden in a, in a very uh, uh, unfair way. It's people who did not create anything who just had the opportunity to take from the USSR uh, the assets of the of the uh, Soviet uh, Republic and and uh, had were in the position to to take hold without paying practically and become a whole uh, billionaires today. Uh, th there is a fantastic description of uh, this world uh, in two books, which I recommend from uh, Bill Browder. Uh, which are really recommendable. The name is uh, Red Notice and Freezing Order. Uh, these two books, the, the, the author uh, had created a fund which was uh, over one billion of investment uh, in the beginning of the, uh, the, of the end of the Soviet Union, and he, he was practically uh, attacked uh, in a very tough way by Putin himself. I think it, it's a, a very good a, a description of, uh, of the mafia world in the Russian uh, area. I have a question. Um, what about the Bitcoin revolution? Ah. <laughs> because I think this is maybe a new way of being uh, there's much hiding. There's, there's a couple of uh, ethical related issues with uh, what we call DeFi, decentralized finance, uh, which is the, um, independent from the uh, international financial system. Just to give you an idea, uh, it's about 1% of the global finance today, but it's growing fast. And it's based, it's built on smart contracts uh, using the blockchain. So you have a number of crypto assets, Bitcoin, Bitcoin and Ethereum are the most famous ones. Um, among the problems, um, it's true, they are being used for uh, laundering purposes and for terrorism financing. We've seen keys, Bitcoin, Bitcoin keys and other crypto asset keys which are even more private than Bitcoin because Bitcoin is traceable. Uh, being shared to raise funds for terrorist organization, uh, Islamic State, inter alia, but it's used by the others. So this is one issue. Another issue is that there's a high number of scams and frauds on cyber heist. So showing that the sector has attracted a high percentage of cro crooks. Third, uh, the whole philosophy behind this uh, DeFi, uh, decentralized finance. It comes from the libertarians, so it's not neutral in terms of political philosophy, with the idea that states 
exert a form of surveillance on their citizens by tracking their financial actions, transactions, behavior. And that um, the idea is to provide an alternative way to uh, exchange values, exchange assets, that would be out of the scopes of the central banks and all the uh, international regulators. And this is also an ethical issue per se, because we know that when there's no state, there's no control, there's no democracy, and you can turn the best idea into a totalitarian system quite easily. So this is also something that we should remember uh, dealing with DeFi. Yes, this artificial money is extremely dangerous uh, because it's, it has no basis and no control. And of course, it uh, pleases uh, young people who uh, are against the establishment. Uh, uh, speculation is uh, very easy. Uh, some people get very rich uh, quickly, uh, but they will get very poor uh, even more quickly. And I, I think it's an extremely dangerous uh, type of uh, activity uh, which uh, Unfortunately, the governments are unable to control. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, really une épée de Damocles uh, on the world economy. Well, w one light of shade. Uh, the main two uh, platforms <laughs> are currently fighting one another. Just those days, literally. The Bitcoin has lost 70% of its value, and the two guys are fighting to death. So we'll see what will happen. Maybe but the problem is it will be it's solved. Go it's good that question are put on this subject because uh, it's, it's not an established fact. Contrary, it's not a real market. It's uh, it's, and even within the, 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 their system, they have competition. It is being said a lot of young entrepreneurs consider it the future, so we see that. With our experience, that's the privilege of age, <laughs> to see that some things can really turn bad uh, despite uh, initially good intentions. And, uh, and I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs and they, they just want the system to be secure. So they come to me and they say, we, we want to make sure that our technology, because we are doing mathematics, so I don't want my math to be used by terrorists, especially in this country, which creates a lot of code for, uh, for the, the assets, but also for coding the crypto keys, they really pay a high degree of attention to the fact that it could be misused by terrorist organization. Um, but they are being used by terrorist organization, and they are being out of the scope of control of the central banks and governments. But young people, they see things uh, in a completely different way. They just see an, an asset which is interesting, fun, uh, looking, future-looking, uh, forward-looking, uh, and they want to, they want to just use it to develop their own business. So it's here. Maybe it's here to stay, and uh, maybe the best way is to sit with them and try to think what could be done to try to control, make sure that a number of things can be um, guaranteed, like traceability um, of the transactions, which is technically feasible on certain types of crypto assets. Not all of them, but some of them. Yes, but uh, the choice would be very difficult. It, it's it's a, such a dangerous uh, system that uh, uh, one cannot imagine because there is no basis whatsoever. And uh, crook can be introduced in a system. Uh, they, they claim that there is a limited number of, uh, of, uh, of offer, but it's not true. It can, be, it can be developed easily in any kind of way. And, and there are many crypto type of monies. And, and many people have lost their shirt trying to uh, become experts on the cryptos <laughs> because uh, out of uh, 10 cryptos created, maybe half will survive over so time. If this uh, session has a, be, has a positive effect, 
is if, if we convince you to avoid this system. <laughs> Especially for the Vatican. <laughs> I have a question that is maybe a, a not naive question, but a stupid question. Um, I, we spoke all day long about uh, it was more about medical, you know, advanced in technology, you know, uh, the technology, innovative technologies in medical uh, industry, and now we are in the banking industry. So, can we say that the fintech? Uh, is dangerous or is not ethics because today we speak about ethics so finance and ethics and fintech is the tomorrow of the <laughs> I'm not sure and another question that is not related to this one but um, you, you spoke earlier about uh, you know all the corruption with Madoff and all the others uh, are there regulations that are still not applicable that you are working on or something that could uh, secure the word maybe from even if you said that there will be more Madoff and other crooks but uh, are, are you not you personally but maybe you know the um, the banking industry or you know uh, are working on an ethic program with oh. regulations there are legislations and they are being enforced. You have for governments an anti-corruption legislation under the umbrella of the United Nations. Right. And for the corporate world, you have uh, an international convention under the auspices of the OECD. So yeah. everything is covered in terms of legislation. Yeah, but Be still. Because <laughs> we have such uh, a creative power in finance you, you, and big means to implement alternative schemes, you, you can always find a way to s well go around and uh, find the right places that will still uh, be bribable. Uh, as far as FinTech is uh, concerned, no, I do not think that they are a danger per se. Uh, as I said, it's a tool. So a tool is not dangerous. It's the use you make of the tool of that sure. could be. So um, maybe this is a little bit naive, but I do believe in, uh, in trying to establish a dialogue with people in charge, people that can leverage on the situation and try to uh, understand how they all leave a double bind, uh, double pressure between performance, the need to perform, otherwise they will lose the situation and there's competition, and, uh, and the compliance, the, the regulations, the legislation that they have to abide by. So it's this kind of balance that has to be found. And sometimes you find out that people do things out of habits and they have blind spots. Everybody has blind spots, including global leaders. So to try to bring some light on those blind spots could prove quite useful. And that's why placing that, that on the, uh, the, the Jerusalem Ethics Forum is so important. I wish to add that there is something in common between a doctor and a banker. We are both confident of the client. <laughs> <laughs> we receive confidences uh, which are uh, very, very, we go very far. It's also work with coaches. <laughs> okay. I have a question. Um, I'm, I'm curious, with the shift of, of, uh, of wealth and power to China in the last five, ten years, and it seems going to continue, how, how do you see that impacting the global financial system, specifically with regards to ethics, to have you know, a new player with very different ideas, it seems? Uh, was a... Uh China is, is uh, today a, a problem. We thought for a while that uh, China was uh, accepting the Western rule of capitalism. Uh, they were building companies competing with the GAFAM. Uh, they, were, uh, they had a place of, like Hong Kong, which was uh, uh, very active. Uh, the fact that uh, since they have a, a new emperor, 
the, the change in attitude uh, is, uh, is very substantial. Uh, and uh, uh, we, it, it get, they get completely separated from the Western uh, capitalism, uh, capitalistic world. Uh, fortunately, they have uh, things to sell to the world, so they, they still will be exchanges, but the exchanges in the financial sector uh, will be very, very narrow and uh, will not be efficient. I fully agree. Um, when I was referring to the challenges ahead for the global governance, China was obviously a big one. Um, they, they, they have no uh, whatsoever respect for uh, um, property rights. So um, this has been causing a lot of problems uh, in international trade. And uh, as far as finance is concerned, they are building their own system. So they will have exchange points with the outside world, and they do have. Uh, for, for trading facilities, but they're also uh, working on their own system to make it strong. A big issue is that uh, they have a lot of uh, treasury bonds, US treasury bonds, um, in, in their assets, so they can leverage at some point on the international economies. Uh, so we have to uh, not to be naive and to always try to assess uh, the strength relationship uh, and there is certainly one as far as finance is concerned. And because of the uh, Ukrainian war, more and more countries in the Western world are finding out that they have to produce many things on their own territory uh, in order not to be dependent of uh, possibly hostile countries. Uh, so th there is a change uh, which is uh, uh, spread spreading now in the Western world uh, in order to, to get, to become slightly more independent. Uh, whereas the Chinese are extremely powerful today uh, because they were wise enough uh, to uh, uh, take hold on many uh, raw materials, especially in Africa, and uh, their bargaining power is very strong. Did we exhaust you? <laughs> Did we depress you? <laughs> Maybe it's a topic, I don't know, or naive, but do you think we could uh, think about a fund, a ESIC fund, uh, built by all those big banks of the world? And like we were talking this morning about doing an ESIC, uh, uh, not forum, but uh, organization, ESIC organization in the world, and with an ESIC fund, and do you think it's yeah, it That's Mary Christie. <laughs> <laughs> no, eth ethical ethics already exist. And you have some funds that are going uh, down the ethic road, uh, investing in, um, in fields or technologies or, or type of financial products that they consider beneficial to the common good. This is very difficult because you, <laughs> it's always this balance I was explaining between performance and, uh, and the rest. Uh, but, uh, but it does exist and it's, it's going bigger. I have some optimism because I spend a lot of time with young people, um, graduates um, from, from top universities around the world, and they all want to make a difference. Maybe that's the privilege of youth, but I find them much more mature that, than I was when I was your, their age. Uh, they really want to commit to the future. They have this environmental um, and climate anxiety, unfortunately, they go together, um, thing in mind, and, uh, and some of them really want to leverage finance to, to make a difference, either on the um, investing, in green technologies or uh, on more social projects. But uh, finance is a leverage and can be a really powerful one. Uh, the, the example of Israel is, is quite interesting. Uh, 
uh, in the past you had people of uh, Bank Apoalim, Bank Leumin, Bank Discount uh, running uh, all over Europe to get uh, accounts uh, with black money in Switzerland. Uh, since Israel joined the OCDE, uh, the Israeli government uh, asked all these banks to stop completely this type of activity. And today, you, you cannot have in Israel a numbered account, and, and, and neither in another country. So uh, the, the Israeli government has uh, turned from practicing uh, using the, these uh, evasion possibilities to being very strict. Always have to play good cop, bad cop, the only way. Okay, so... Mm -hmm.